I mentioned, we are going to um, uh, talk about um, some topics and doing kind of lecture today. So today it's not going to be uh, some kind of a lab, okay? And we said that right from the beginning of the semester, which means any time that we are a little behind from the, from the topics, we're going to use a little bit of the, the lab, and then we're going to switch uh, uh, to, um, to the regular lab work. So we talked about last time, we talked about references. Let me just, uh, and overloading. Let me bring up the, the notes, and as usual, again, I think this is going to be the last time that I'm going to create the, uh, the project, and the next time uh, I am not going to create this anymore, and it's going to be the same. So create new project, CC++, next, select the repository. In your case, it's going to be your works repository. In my case, it's going to be OOP244, NAA, and NBB. Before you do anything to your repository, always pull your repository to make sure if there are any changes to the repository, you apply that to it. And as you see, oh, it's actually saying, what does it say? Oh, <laughs> this is last semester. This is where I want to go. One more time. So you pull. And as you see, I had some changes made, so I'll, uh, um, I applied to them, and now I'm going to go and create it. So we are in section ZAA, and this is 03. Project is 03, January 19th. 19. Create the project. If we have time today, I'm going to demonstrate with Xcode for those people who have lab uh, max how to do the things that you're supposed to do. Um, but uh, let me just pause and ask a question before we do that. Uh, yeah. So let me uh, have the thing, you know, like bring what we have done last time to kind of today and take a look at them and see uh, what we did, and then we continue after that. So. <clears throat> What we have done was actually this. Let me just copy your, uh, even better, let me just open the files. So, set AA. Kind of do a quick review of what we have talked about, and then we'll see what we are going to do. So, uh, the first thing that we have done, we mentioned that, uh, um, yeah, it's recording. First thing we have done was mentioning that we can have functions with the same name and different uh, arguments, and we said that that's one of the first aspects of polymorphism that you see in uh, C++, the fact that you have the same action being done in different ways. And then after doing that, we mentioned in case the, the logics of, uh, uh, if the logic of what you are doing in different uh, functions are identical, instead of actually uh, overloading, you can use the feature of default value for arguments and, and make your functions accept, uh, make sure, make your function arguments accept default values. And the default values will be taken from right side. So you can skip the arguments passed from right side. And um, if the argument is not provided, the value that you mentioned over there will be actually passed to the function. Um, and we have to mention that these values must be in the prototype of the function only, not in the body of the function. So I cannot put default value over here in the function itself. Here, no default values. Prototype, default values. Why? Because prototypes of the functions are where you actually introduce your function to your code. And that's where the compiler actually gets the idea of there is a, a default value and I can pass to it. Yes? 
I'll make it bigger? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Better? Is it okay? All right. All right. So, and that's what we have done. But well, again, uh, be, uh, bear in mind, and we actually, if I recall uh, correctly, that we, when we actually did this, we created the bar 65 over here, and 70 A's we said will be printed. Remember that? So I'm going to bring that in, and uh, so these are actually I'm going to save here now. So oh, F A, I'm going to save it in the current one here. Save and save in the current one. And save in the current one just to kind of add one more thing to it. Okay. So now that we have all these things over here, and uh, let me just add them to the solution. So already existing files, just go to the name of the solution, right click, add existing item, and select the items you want to add. A common mistake for students and later on causes trouble is that by mistake they add files from the directory that does not belong to your solution. Remember, if you're adding another source to your file or header for whatever, it must be in the directory of your solution, not somewhere else. Yes? Yes. So use mine as a book. Don't modify anything. So I have one directory of and one directory. Yeah, so one repository, my mind, not directory, it's a repository, correct? And one repository is yours. So you look at mine to read. At any moment you want to change any code, copy that subdirectory into your own workspace and then modify it over there. That's the best way of doing it. Sure. That's perfect. That's perfect. Yeah, why not? You can do it. Like, as, as long as you do, the thing is that, let me tell you what's going on. If you start modifying my repository, okay, because you don't have push permission, you, can, you have only pull permission. If I change a file that you have changed yourself in your repository on, the, on upstream, next time you pull, it's going to be a conflict. Because it tells you you are trying to merge it with something that you change it yourself. And there's going to be trouble. We don't want that. OK? Uh, so that's that. Uh, yeah. So we'll come over here. I, yeah, I'm going to select all the things that I want to add. And as you see, I'm selecting them all. And I'm going to click on Add. And it's going to put everything in their proper places. So in here, um, we mentioned that if I actually put over here 65, when I actually run the program, you will see that what's being executed will be actually 70 A's printed over there. Okay? But what if I don't want that? What if I want, if they put an integer at the beginning, that would be the length with, with assignment operator, like the default one. If that's the case, because the logic is not same anymore, the argument sequence is different. Now it's the time to overload and not use the fault arguments. So now I can actually come over here and create another bar that accepts an integer over here. And then create this bar in here saying void bar integer length. And then in here, I'm going to say bar with assignment and length. So now, as you see, this one, it, this one had to be, uh, this one had to be overloading because the sequence of the arguments are not the same. And now, if I run the program, now if I rerun the program, it's still doing it that 
Why is it doing that? That shouldn't. Oh, maybe I. Ch oh, you know what happened? Perfect. I exactly. I. I told you what not to do, and I made that boo boo. Now let me show you. Let me close these. Save. Let me close all these and show you what happened. That's perfect example for it. Take a look. Why is it thinking so hard? Oh, I thought that I actually changed these by mistake. Let me see one more time. Okay, let me open it up again. Make sure I don't have those. And I'm going to open this. It's here. In here. All right. So we have that one. Let me see what happens. So I'm going to actually, I'm going to put a stop sign right beside this. I'm going to put a, uh, a break point. Press F5 so it runs and stops at that. Okay. Now I'm going to press F11 and see where it goes. It's actually going to the length. And it's, so what happened? Boy, last time it didn't work properly. I don't know. Anyways, it wasn't compiled properly. But now you will see it will actually work. Now, if two types are too close to each other and it doesn't work because it becomes confused, like, for example, you have over here uh, an unsigned integer and an integer. These two, compiler cannot identif identify the difference between the two types. They are too close with each other for, for the compiler to identify the difference between the two types. If that's the case, then either you have to use proper literal values, like if it's, a, if it's an unsigned integer, you have to put 1, 2, 3, u, to actually tell the compiler what is being passed is unsigned, or cast the value to the type you want to call to differentiate between the types if there is a conflict because of overloading, OK? So the types are different, but like it's a float and a double, OK? When things like that happens, make sure that, uh, yeah. So that's that. So I'm going to actually call this one A now because it's, I'll make this A. Okay, and I do not need to save this, and we go up. Okay, so the next thing we want to talk about with refer references, I gave you the example uh, about, uh, I told you, call me Freddy, my name is Fardat, call me uh, Freddy, remember that? Um, for that, uh, uh, we said that C has that capability. You can actually assign aliases to uh, variables. You can give new names to variables, and uh, uh, we demonstrated by actually, um, let me see, there you go. We, so we demonstrated by showing if you put an ampersand after a type, that ampersand with type together mean reference, okay? We had the exact same thing in IPC 144. Now, I want an honest answer on this one. How many of you have problem with pointers? Like when I say I have problems, is you don't like them, you, you cannot work with them properly. You make a boo-boo over and over. How, how many of you pointers are not crisp, is not crystal clear for? And don't be shy. All right, OK. So it's very possible, although, again, we're going to fall behind, but I'm going to have a quick lecture on pointers, too, what I usually do in IPC 144. It's going to take you through pointers to tell you what pointers are. So when we are getting to it, we'll see exactly how everything works. Uh, is that a question, or you're just scratching your head? Oh, scratching your head. Because <laughs> you did like this, and I didn't know if <laughs> it was a question or, yeah. So, so that's that. So we said, um, so integer and ampersand together, they actually mean integer reference. Never call it integer ampersand, OK, or integer and. Don't do that. Always name it the way it is, and then it's going to sink in, OK? One of the biggest mistakes is that, People, when they read, they say character asterisk or character star A or character star P, and they say P is a pointer. Never do that. If an asterisk comes after a type, it's a pointer. So it's an integer pointer, 
If it's an employee asterisk, it's employee pointer, you have to always mention it properly. We'll come to it soon. Yes. Okay, uh, how does it work, you're, you're telling me? For you, as a user, it's just an alias. Nothing exists back there. As a user, so they designed it in a way so it's completely transparent. So you should think in that code, for example, that I have integer reference R and integer A, that R does not occupy any space, which means R is just a new name for A. Therefore, you have one location in memory. I'll prove it to you. So see what I'm going to do in here. I'm going to say C out. In here, I'm going to say unsigned. By the way, in C++, the casting goes the other way. OK? In C, casting goes around the type. In C++, casting goes around the thing you are, you are casting. So in here, I'm going to say address of. A, and I'm going to put a dash, and I'm going to pr put another one, and I'm going to say unsigned. Oh, but of course, C version works too, address of R. So when I add this one over here as my main add existing item, that is, uh, I didn't bring CREF. I thought I brought CREF. I didn't bring CREF. Cancel. Uh, let me save it here. So in here, I'm gonna men call it. I'm gonna call it BREF because it's the second topic we are talking about. Okay, and I'm gonna add it to the to the code. Okay, now. If I run this program, you will see that the addresses are identical. You want me to make it bigger? Let me just make it bigger. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Let me. You see the addresses? They are identical which means they are the same place in memory. The way it is, the way it is implemented, please, he's an evil person. Do not listen to him, okay? I'm just letting you know. Just hear it and forget it. Behind the scene, references are implemented using pointers. Behind the scene, okay? Got that? Behind the scene, references are implemented using pointers. But above, on the scene, they are just aliases. They are literally a new type called reference. OK? So you shouldn't think of how it is implemented, what's going. You just should assume that when you are actually uh, creating your reference, you are creating a new name for an already existing thing. And that's it. It is exactly, my name is Fardat, call me Freddy. There is no new person over here. There is no agenda. There is no implementation. It's just one person that is called Fardad and Freddy. And they occupy the same space in the space-time space -time continuum. OK? Am I making sense? You're not satisfied. Not syntax. Then it's two names for the same thing. I don't know how, how else to mention it. It's not that the syntax is different. That See, after, after you create the R in here, after you create this R in here, after you create that reference R and set it to be the reference of A, R and A are equal things. They are exactly the same thing. They are names of the same integer, two names for the same integer, a snake with two heads. It's not two snakes, <laughs> okay? And that's you, what you need to learn. That's what you need to have by default. There is nothing else behind it. It's not that the syntax is the same or whatever. No, the names are the same. That's all. The names, the two names are the names of the same place. That's all.
Okay? So, and we mentioned because of this fact, because of this fact, it creates a nice side effect, which is which is oh I didn't save that one either. I didn't save anything in here. It creates a good side effect, which is when you pass, when you set the argument of a function being a reference, when the function is called, because the arguments by design are set to the value that is being passed to them, to the thing that is being passed to them, when when set is called in here, the set to 30 is called, R becomes a new name for the A inside main. Therefore, whatever you do to R is what you are doing to A. And they are identical, absolutely no difference. Okay? That eliminates the need of pointers to pass back values through the argument list. Because now, what you have inside the function is just a reference. And you don't need to put, like, if I wanted to write that set to 30 with pointers, which I can because uh, we can overload it, this was the syntax. I should have said integer pointer r. Then in here, I should have said target of r is 30, which I don't need to anymore. Because this is a pointer, it becomes address of A, and let's call that P. So and when I call the, so in here I'm going to say A set to 200, and again I'm going to say set to 30. When I actually call this, I have to put address of A, and therefore the function call will be set The function call will be set to 30, and integer pointer PTR will be set to address of A, and therefore PTR will actually point to A, and I can change the value of it through that one. Are we clear on that? So we use this feature to write a little read function of ours, so let me just put over here another C out. A, just to see what happens over there. So using these features, we created the read function. And in that read function, I took an advantage and kind of introduced you to C in object two, to tell you what C in object can do. So we saw that uh, I created a read function that returns a Boolean, which is the success of reading, if it's successful or not. And I pass back the values using the reference of the variable I'm receiving, yes. Later. Okay, when I'm, when I'm talking about, I'm gonna do a lecture on, separately on pointers. When we get to it, then you'll see. Okay, so, so what happens over here is that um, I am uh, creating a reference uh, called val over here. I, 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 and this is always what you do. This is a standard thing. Again, get a, take, get a habit of this one, okay? Uh, for now, we are rookies, do this. Whenever a function returns something, create a, temporary, create a temporary variable right at the beginning and accumulate what you want to return over there. So if, I'm, if, I, am writing a, if I am writing a function foo with uh, double foo like that, then in here say double, return, and you can make it uh, zero. The universal way I set, of, of setting something to its default value is to put empty curly brackets in front of it. Anything you wanted to reset it, put empty curly bracket in front of it when you are creating them. Another new syntax uh, to, to remember. So, and then say return, ret, then start coding. Remember I told you this is an empty destructor, 
uh, sorry, uh, empty header file. When you create a header file, first do this, then think. When you create write a function that returns something, that's how you do it. You create a temp, you return it, then think how am I supposed to do what I'm supposed to do so return is, is packed up. Do it always this way. Never, ever, you're allowed to have more than one return statement in OOP244 in your function. When you go higher, then you're going to write certain logics that kind of is cooler to do it with, uh, one return, with, with multiple return statements, but not now, like recursion and stuff, which we do not care at the moment. Yes. You use breaks anywhere other than switch, and the mark for your workshop will be zero. Because breaks are literally go-tos. We abandon go-to. You know that there is a command called go-to in C++? It was abandoned 35 years ago when structured programming came through, when there was no C++, because it created what they call spaghetti code, because all the execution would go everywhere. As of that moment, break and continue and go to or abandon, you are not using it, as if they don't exist. The only place you use the break is within a switch statement because it's designed to be used by it. But breaking a loop with a break statement is essentially you're lazy because you didn't want to write an if statement or set the condition of the loop to false. That's the only reason, okay? And continue is a go-to, premature is a premature go-to to the beginning of the loop again, which is awful. Like that's the worst type of go-to, okay? So please, break and continue, do not use. All right. And thank you very much for the question, by the way. No, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give you zero for your workshop. That's just me being scary, like I scare my daughter. If you don't do that, no more cell phones, okay? It's <laughs> so it's something like that. But, but, uh, so, but first time I'm gonna tell you not to do it, but the second time you're gonna pay for it by marks, okay? But I will not reject it, okay? So first time you're gonna receive an email from me, say, what the heck is this? And then, all right. Oh, by, uh, as I mentioned, you can always correct your code and resubmit, okay? If your first successful submission is before the due date, even if you submit corrections late, you get the full mark. Remember that. So corrections will never, ever cost you, okay? So if you submit it through submitter, and it works, even if you have segmentation fault, which you have no idea what it is now, like memory leaks and stuff. We're gonna find out what it is today. But, so, what I'm saying is that even if you fix those after the, after the submission, after the, when it's, uh, when it's late, uh, uh, you are not gonna get penalized, okay? Remember that. So yes, so we created a function. We uh, said it's gonna return success. We used C in to read it, and we said C in is a polymorph object, and the extraction operator works for any type that you put in front of it, any primitive type. Otherwise, we'll, other ones we're gonna design later. So you can use it for employees and students and stuff too. So we're gonna teach you actually how to overload operators, like you do functions. So you can actually make the plus sign do something else. Obviously, you're going to make it do addition, but for other things, okay? We can do that. So C in is, has a polymorph extraction operator. That extraction operator comes from C language, which is actually right shift operator, okay? But we call it extraction because it's used for that in C++. Extraction operator extracts something from the console input and puts it into the value that you have. Because it's an integer, it's going to expect an integer. If you put something over there that cannot be read as an integer, scene fails. And when scene fails, it becomes as functional. It will not function anymore. Okay? It will literally be quiet and it will not respond to anything other than one thing that is a member function called clear. When you call its member function, you are acknowledging that I know you failed, clear the status of failure, and now continue. Obviously, after that, because we couldn't read from console, we need to wipe the console out, and I demonstrated that with another uh, method of cin. So what is a method? Method is a member function, okay? 
another method of seeing called ignore that ignores so many characters or whatever you put over there. So if you want to read up to comma, it's going to read and it's going to get the comma and throw it away. You can do it like that if you want to. But remember, ignore eats the delimiter too, which means the new line will be thrown into garbage too. So we said if C in failed, first of all, what I'm going to return is going to be false. And I initially set it to true. Then I say clear yourself, wipe out the keyboard, and return the result out so the person who's receiving knows that the value is not read properly. Are we okay down to this point? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? Okay, so down to this point. Beautiful. So that was just a review on that. So in here I'm going to say... C, it's going to be uh, ref and C in review. So the next thing we want to talk about needs pointers to the bone. So I am going to talk about pointers now. Okay. So let me pause recording. So we want to kind of do a quick review on pointers. And I want everybody's attention. If you know exactly what pointers are, be quiet and don't say a thing, OK? Be quiet and don't say. I want to kind of rush through it. So I want everybody to understand some background noise uh, with you and your friend. Please do not do that. I know you are all ex experts back there, but please. Uh, uh, um, Respect others. Anyways, so the, the, the memory in your computer is essentially a series of bytes. It's a huge array of characters, an array of bytes in your computer. And each byte is, a tag, is tagged with a number, a sequence number, that starts from 0 and goes up to whatever the size of your memory is. Uh, this tag, this index, is called address. Okay, they call it address. Why? Because with that index, they can actually access the memory. The smallest piece of memory that you can access in the memory of your computer is a character. It's a byte. Okay, we have smaller pieces called bits too, which is each byte is eight bits. But those bits are not addressable. You cannot say, I want 56 bit in memory. You can't do that. For that, you have to jump through hoops. Okay. But so, and even computer is not aware of it. Computer only knows a byte that can take 256 different situations, it's different states. And that's the smallest piece of memory. And that's why the address relates to the byte. Are we clear on that? Okay, so when you, when you create a variable in your program, you write int var, a piece of memory to the size of that variable is dedicated for you while your program is running and is tagged with the name you are actually using. So when you are saying int var, you can actually, or if you say a double d var, again, another piece of memory that is this time 8 bytes will be allocated for you. Now, what is the address of var? 108, remember. Where it begins, that's the address. And what is the address of diva? 132. Perfect. All right? So when you actually assign values to these variables, the value is written in binary in and covers the entire piece of memory that you have. So it doesn't matter how small is the value. If you put one zero, it wipes everything up. Okay, so that piece is that. And if I set over here a double value, that's exactly what happens. Are we cool with this? Okay. So I want you to please completely forget everything you know about pointers now. I want a blank canvas. Okay. I want a blank canvas. And I'm serious about it. So 
you can create a type of variable called pointer. A pointer variable is exactly like an integer. As you see over there, it's called PTR, the green one. It's not shown very nicely over there. That's the one. It's exactly like an integer because it is an integer. It's an actually an on-site integer. It cannot have negative values because you can't have a negative address. You cannot have address minus 55. It doesn't make sense. So it is literally an unsigned integer and nothing else. Okay? It's a pointer. Its job, instead of holding regular integer values, is to hold the address of other things. What is the address? The sequence number of that thing in memory. So essentially, if I, like for example, if I can literally say PTR is equal to 102. When I say PTR is equal to 102, like a regular integer, it's going to hold the value 102, which means it means it's going to point to the address 102, which makes absolutely no sense because that doesn't belong to us. It's somewhere in memory. And we have no way as human beings to be able to keep track of these addresses. It's exactly like codes, single codes that we put around letters because we cannot remember the ASCII code. If I knew the, all the ASCII codes, I didn't need to write single code, a single code. I would write 65, right? It's the same thing. Because we cannot actually see where the variables sit, we cannot do something like this. I don't know that the var is actually sitting in address 108 to manually put 108 over here so PTR can actually point to var. I can't do that. Because I can't do that, we have a, something called address of. So I can actually write address of, PTR is address of var, and what happens over here, it extracts the address of var in memory and returns it, which goes to PTR and therefore PTR becomes 108. And that's how I extract everything from the computer, from the uh, that's how I extract the address from entities in the RAM, okay? And if I want to, for some reason, if I do not want to access that variable using the variable name itself, and I want to use the pointer instead, I know that I can just use the name of the pointer because it means I'm setting the pointer. I want to set the target of the pointer. Therefore, there is something over there called target of, and that target of actually tells to the C++ language that 2345 is not supposed to go to PTR. 2345 will go to the target of PTR, which means where PTR is pointing, which is address 108, which happens to be the integer that we extracted the address of, and when you say target of, this actually sets the value to 2345. Are we clear about this? Are we okay with this? Yes. We've got to come to it. What did I say before I started? Uh-huh. Okay? Take my advice. Please take my advice, okay? Erase everything. Okay. The target of. Okay. If you recall, in previous slide, I said that I can manually set something to the value of the pointer. I can say PTR is 108, and it puts the value 108 inside PTR. Do we understand that? Now, how can I put something through PTR in var? How can I put something through PTR into var? That's when I write target of in front of it. Okay, so if I don't do that, I'm setting the pointer. I don't want to set the pointer. I want to set the target of pointer, and therefore I write over here, target of pointer. Are we okay with this? All right, let me just do something before we get, pause it right down to this point. Pause it. Pause it, please. Uh, 
Just digest what I said down to this point, and I'm going to get back to you in a second. Just a second. There we go. Bear with me with for a second. Bear with me for a second. I'm just cleaning up the thing so I can give you the example for it. Just a second. Okay, back to business. Where is it? Uh, all right. Oh, and I should have paused it. I didn't, so I have to uh, edit this video afterwards because I don't want those pieces to be seen. So, um, all right. So, this is where we were standing now. And, all right. Forty-three fourteen. Somebody remember that number. Forty-three fourteen. That's where I have to go back and take the piece up because I didn't pause and I just was making. So, so do we understand what just happened over here? Are we okay with this? Okay, so essentially what I was saying was that I can write, for example, uh, oh, let me go back, let me go back, let me go back. Okay, so now, so we do it like this and it goes and it sets it up and we should be able to, and we should be able to print the variable using, sorry, it was for IPC, that's why you see printf over there. With printf, so I print the value, and uh, the output's got to be 2, 3, 4, 5. And if I actually print target of PTR, the result's got to be still 3, 4, 5. And if I print percent %u, which is an unsigned PTR itself, it's got to actually print the address of the variable. Are we okay with these outputs? Everybody's okay with this? Right? Because, yeah, so... When I say print the variable, 2, 3, 4, 5 is printed. When I say print target of PTR, target of PTR is the variable that is printed. And when I say print PTR, it's going to print only the address, which is the address very sitting in memory. Are we good? So having said so, what if I 
want to now point to DVAR, the double one. So when I say PTR is equal to address of DVAR, therefore the address of the double goes away there, that is 132. Are we all okay with this? I want your attention here. I kind of lost you for a second to, to make my example. We're okay with this? Okay, because of this, there's gonna come a problem. When I actually want to set the target of PTR, how does it know that it's now eight bytes? When I set the target of integer, it puts it in four bytes, correct? When I'm putting the target of double, how does it know that it's actually a double? So we can't do this. Our definition of a pointer is not right. To actually be able to have a pointer, the pointer itself needs to know what is sitting at that R address. The pointer needs to know, I am pointing to an integer. I am pointing to an employee. I am pointing to a car. I am pointing to a double. It needs to know. So our design for pointer is wrong. It should have been something like this. I should say integer pointer PTR. Not only pointer PTR. And then everything is going to go clear and nice. And I can actually set it. And when I set it, it knows the target is PTR. Uh, an integer, it knows four bytes like an integer will be overwritten and everything is going to be fine. And when I say double pointer DPTR, now DPTR actually becomes a pointer that is dedicated to point to doubles. And therefore, uh, when I extract the address, it's going to be done correctly. And when I actually set it to something, it knows the target is eight bytes and it's going to write it over there and everything is going to work exactly as it supposed to. So essentially what I was saying is that I can say something like integer pointer point, pointer p and I can say p is equal to address of a if I have over here a as an integer let, let, let's say it's 30 right and in here, I can actually say C out target of P. And doing so, it's going to actually print the 30 that is sitting at the target, correct? Right? And if I actually set the target, and, but if I just print P, what's going to happen? Then it's going to show me where A is in memory in hexadecimal. I could have said unsigned, then you would have seen what it is. And, but if I, and, and I can actually use that target to set the A to something else. So I can actually say target of P is equal to A, right? So is equal to, sorry, 400. Now if I see out A, obviously what is going to get printed over here will be 400 because A is now changed to 400. Do we understand this? Did you even know such things existed in C language? You can actually write that? Of course, because it's not. This is what I did. Pointers.h. You see what I did? That's why I say name the damn thing as what it is. It is really that. An asterisk is sometimes target of, sometimes pointer. Address of is address of. So how do we recognize these things? How do we recognize what is what? This is how we do it. We say Pointers in C is presented with an asterisk. We just accomplished that, right? And so essentially, wherever I have pointer, I just need to put an asterisk. But please realize the asterisk belongs to the type, not to the variable. It's not integer star PTR. It's integer star PTR, <laughs> okay? And 
The address of is represented by, a, by ampersand. So wherever I have address of, I'll simply put an, amp, uh, uh, an ampersand. And target of, again, is presented by asterisk, which is kind of an a awful thing because now I'm confused. Which one is what? So we're going to say target of and pointer are both presented by asterisk, right? So if the, the asterisk comes after a type, it means type pointer, like employee pointer, like book pointer like double pointer, like character pointer, like that, or a double pointer, or a structure employee pointer. But of course, in C++, C++ you create a structure, it becomes automatically a type. You don't need to put struct anymore. OK? So employee pointer. These are all pointers. If the asterisk comes in front of a variable as a unary operator, what is a unary operator? Like minus 5, not a, plus 2, like a unary operator. If the asterisk comes before the variable's name, variable name, then it means actually that is a pointer. So now I have to say a is equal to target of p. OK? So asterisk before a variable means target of. Asterisk after a type means pointer. OK? Or target of t is equal x. So it means t is a pointer and such and such. And when asterisk makes sense, it's just multiplication. a is said to be multiplied by target of c. So C is a pointer. This is just a multiplication. All right? Again, make it a little juicier. E is equal to target of M multiplied by C multiplied by C. So in this scenario, the only thing that is a pointer is a mass. OK, so that's a mass pointer, M pointer. Are we OK with this? Do, are we clear about syntax and what pointers are? OK? But that's not the only thing. One thing that we did not mention in IPC 144, probably, or maybe somebody did and I'm not aware of it, is the relationship between pointers and arrays. As we talked about, as we talked about, variables actually s s occupying some space in memory and pointers occupying uh, a space in memory like a regular variable. And we can set them up and all the good stuff that we have. When you create an array like this, when you say integer AR5, first of all, five pieces a space enough, conti contiguous space in memory that can hold five integers back to back will be occupied for you. So if you want five million integers, it's very possible that you have four gigs of RAM free. But if they are fragmented, you cannot. It's going to tell you not enough memory. OK? So it has to be back to back. And then what it does is this. So when we actually set the index, it sets the index, and life is beautiful. We know all that. But what happens behind the scene is this. When you actually say integer AR5, what happens is that it creates a constant integer pointer called AR that is actually the name of your array. That's somewhere else. Then it puts the address of the beginning of the array in there. And because of that fact, you have an array. And that's why the index of the array is actually first, uh, zero is the first element. Because you are saying from AR go zero elements further, which means the first one. That's how it's implemented, literally. So you can actually use them interchangeably, which means you can actually say target of A is 2, 3, 4, 5. So 
Tar target of AR, so you can actually treat the name of an array like a pointer, and you are essentially dealing with the first element of the array. Or you can use its index and do it that way. Or if you're crazy enough, you can actually use pointer notation, which is saying target of A plus 2 is equal to 555, five, five, which means AR address plus 2, which means two integers further. Give me the target. It's the same thing as the other one. So now it actually overwrites that 4 with 5s. And that what we call pointer notation for arrays. Arrays, pointers, potatoes, potatoes. The only difference between an array and a regular pointer is that a regular pointer usually, with C knowledge, points to one thing, but an array pointer always points to series of things, and it holds the address of the beginning of the series. Do we understand this? Are we good? Beautiful. And that was pointers in a nutshell. Now, let's talk. Uh, yes. If you if you make it constant, then it won't point anywhere. So <clears throat> when it's a constant integer pointer, it only so. If this is a constant integer pointer, it is doomed to only point to that mug. I cannot put my hand because it's a constant. It cannot point to that one. But if it wasn't the constant integer pointer, I would say, now it's pointing to that one. Now it's pointing to that one. Now it's pointing to that one. I can change where it points to. The reason the name of the array is a constant is that they don't want you to set it by mistake and lose your array. OK? <clears throat> if you, but for, if you want your single value not to point to anything else, sure, you can do that. <clears throat> OK, so <clears throat> what do we want to do? So in here, I'm going to say <clears throat> pointers. I'm going to say uh, CD. I'm going to call it fake pointers, just for you to see what they are. <clears throat> Last time when I did this, I usually do a review of OP, uh, IPC 144 at the beginning of the semester for OP244. Students, so one of the students was so angry, like, why didn't they teach us that thing? Because it's so easier that uh, <laughs> after I showed the header file, it was like, you are out. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah, um, I had, let me just pause something. <clears throat> so, now, <clears throat> let's say this is my, uh, What's the time? 2.42, we end at 3.20, right? 3.15, 3.15. That gives us 30 minutes. If I give you eight minutes break, will it really be eight minutes? Please, OK? Because I want to start dynamic memory allocation. For that, I need some fresh brains, OK? So uh, eight minutes, OK? And we'll be back. And I'm going to go grab some water, too. Let's, let's set a problem and see if we can solve it. I'm asking you to uh, uh, read a few integers from the entry and print them in reverse order. How are you going to go about this? So that's, I'm your client, and you say, what do you want? I say, I want a program that reads few integers and prints them in reverse order. How do you code? Anyone? No, oh, well, yeah, but what, well, like, yes. Yeah, we can use for loop, but where do you keep those integers? How big is the array? Well, I don't know how many integers. It could be three or three million. So for, 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 a, for his thinking program, 
that is supposed to get few integers and print it in reverse, so we want to occupy the whole memory of the computer. <laughs> no, we cannot. It's, it's not solvable. Anything you say, Josh, anything you say, anything you say will not work. The only way is that when the program is starting, ask the user, how many integers do you have? So while the program running, not while you're programming, when you program, you can say integer A50. But I want to be able to say integer A50 when the program is running. It means you're not there. You're executable. So your executable should create an array when it's running. How is that possible? It's impossible unless. We just learned. <coughs> so, I'll, so, so I'm going to ask the user, hey, how many integers do you have? Right? So that's the first thing I'm going to do. So in here, I'm going to have integer A. Right? And in here, I'm going to have integer num. That's the number of things, right? Let's set it to zero. Get used to that. Set everything to zero when you, when you start it. Don't leave stuff hanging, OK? And then in here, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to say, how many ints? And I can go to new line and show a prompt. Be professional. <laughs> okay? And then I'm going to read that integer. So I'm going to say int, uh, C in, into num. Of course, when you go home, you're going to actually write a proper function to receive an integer and, you know, make it foolproof, just as a practice. I taught you everything you need to know to do that. Failing and ignoring. That's all you need to do to, all you need to write a fail-proof function, a get in function that does that does full proof, not fail proof, full proof uh, uh, integer entry. But anyway, so we get the integer, fine. Now I need to, I, can I say integer, uh, bad naming, CNT, that's the number, how many counts? Okay, so that's the number. And in here I'm going to say num. Can I say, can I do this? No, because. This is going to get compiled. When it wants to get compiled, compiler needs to know how many to occupy it, remember? So what can I do? I go back to my knowledge of uh, arrays. We said an array, when I say integer num something, num is actually a pointer pointing to series of integers. So what I need to do is to tell to the compiler, I have an integer pointer num is set to new int cnt, which means while it's running, it's going to ask the operating system not in the memory of the program, but in heap. Where is heap? Shared memory of all programs. It asks the, 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 the operator. So in here, your program with the keyword new asks the operating system, I want new 50 integers Give me its address. Either there are 50 integers and the address goes to num, or there is not enough where it returns a null. So all I need to do over here is to say if num is equal to null PTR, rep representing null PTR. Null PTR is a constant that represents a null pointer. It's within the syntax of the language, null PTR. You don't need to include anything for it. Null PTR means null pointer. So if num is null PTR, I'm going to say C out, not enough memory. OK? Otherwise, now I can do whatever I want to do, correct? Right? And Remember, because you asked for it, you have to take care of it. That's one of the powers and weaknesses of C++. In Java, you just do that. You don't care for 
giving back the memory to the operating system. And as your program is running, when it finds enough time, it wipes it up. That's why Java programs don't run smooth. They come, 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 then pause, memory, garbage collection, go, garbage. That's why you don't see games with Java programming, because the character will run and suddenly stop, and then run again and stop. So that's not going to happen, right? But all the games are written in C++ because you decide when to. But most of the time, you forget. <laughs> and when you forget, that's memory leak, which means your program ends, and the memory remains occupied until you reboot your computer. Have you ever had the problem that Rogers, you call Rogers and say, my modem is not working. Unplug it for 15 seconds and plug it back in. Why do you think that is? The program has memory leak. Every single time you're connecting and disconnecting, it just leaves a couple of bytes in memory. And after three months, all the memory is filled with garbage. You have to take it off, put it back in to wipe everything up. OK? So you have to make sure this is something that is, should be your habit. You, you, you allocate. You make sure at the end you delete what you allocated exactly how you allocate it. So in here, I'm going to say num. Again, <clears throat> when you are saying delete num, it deletes target of num. Delete's job is to actually delete that. It's, it goes to the address and gives it back to the operating system. Says, I'm done with this. It's yours. Thank you. I don't want it anymore. You can have one integer if you want this. It's crazy. You never want to do that. Why you want one integer dynamically? That's stupid, right? You don't want that, but you can. Why? Because it's not always only one integer. Sometimes you have one employee, and the employee has ginormous amount of memory. So you can want to just allocate one employee. You can do that, although it's nuts. It's absolutely crazy, out of my freaking brain. But I'm going to actually do the counter dynamic too, just to show you how a single one works. So in here, I'm going to say cnt is equal to new int. You know what it looks like? An array with one element. <laughs> it's like you're saying integer a1. Have you ever done that? <laughs> Nobody does it, right? But you can. That's the thing. But as you see, this int doesn't have squared bracket at the end, right? So if I am deleting it, I ha and, and by the way, because that's an integer, I have to now go target of cnt and target of cnt and so on and so forth. And at the end, I have to say delete cnt, but no square brackets. How you allocate, that's how you deallocate. If you forget the square bracket for num, it only deletes the first element. The rest is leak. That's one of the most common leaks you can do. And that's the syntax. There is nothing else. Now in here, I have exactly the amount that I want. So I can just say over here for integer i set to 0, i less than target of cnt. That's the number of things I have, right? And i plus plus. Now in here, I can say c out i plus 1 and put something right in front of it so they can enter it. Now, then I can say C in into num, and I treat it exactly like a regular array. Absolutely no difference. C in into numbers. It's an array still. No difference. It's an array. But the array is dynamic. And the good thing is that it, it fits exactly how I want. If it's five, it's exactly five. If it's five million, it is exactly 5 million, not uh, an integer more or not an integer less. So now I can freely get all these things, and I can now say over here something like mm, reversed. And go for, don't do this. If you have a counter, the integer i, you, you, you can do that with C and C++. But if you do that, compilers comp sometimes don't agree with this. Some compilers say i is inside the for loop. Some compilers say i is outside of the for loop. So what I write over here, if I put another int i, it may work. But then I get it somewhere, it says you're redeclaring i. 
So you wait only if you have one loop. Now I have two. I'm going to take the uh, int i so, out. So I'm going to say integer i. Obviously, as usual, I'm going to nullify it. And I'm going to take this out now. And in here, I'm going to say i equals to target of cnt minus 1, i greater than or equal to 0, and i minus minus. And I'm going to see out num i and go to new, or let's put a space between, something like that, and see out at the end. So now what I'm doing in here is essentially this. I am allocating one single integer because I just want to show you why. No need, stupid thing to do. Just for practice, to show you, because when we come to compound types, you are going to allocate a structure who has a big array in it. Then it makes sense to have one entity dynamically allocated. Okay, so how many ints? I'm going to get it, and in here it's going to say whatever. I'm going to put it inside that integer, and I'm going to allocate exactly that many integers. If it's null, I'm going to say not enough memory. I think the last time I saw that message was 30 years ago, because <laughs> now my phone has more memory than a supercomputer in 30 years ago. So, so we usually don't have that problem. By the way, so now let's walk through it and see how it works. Put this one at left, put this one at right. Uh, I'm going to make this as small as I can. Can you see it back there? End of the class. <clears throat> OK, get you this, use this F10, F11, and then X code is F6 and X, F8. F7 and F8, okay, to walk through your code, okay? <clears throat> so I'll do F10, <clears throat> and I come in. And as you see CNT, some garbage value, you see the question marks? It means I don't know what the heck is this. As soon as I do new int, it's still garbage, but it has some value in it. It's my garbage, <laughs> okay? It's not any garbage, it's my garbage. Now I'm going to say how many ints. I'm going to get an integer over here. <clears throat> I'm not going to go crazy. I'm going to say four. <laughs> I don't want to put 5,000 over there, right? Now, <clears throat> target of CNT is four, correct? So now I have four integers over there. And I'm going to say, hey, and as you see, my number is garbage. But as soon as I go over here and pass through it, now it's my garbage, CNT of them. Unlike arrays that when you put on it, put Bring the mouse over it. It shows all the elements. C has no idea if it's one or five million because it's now you who's deciding how many uh, values you have inside the array, not C. Therefore, the ID has no way to know if this is an array. It could be a single entity. But we know it is not. So, and because it is not null, it means actually it worked. So integer i0, and it goes up to 4, and it's going to ask one by one. So I'm going to bring it over here. I don't want to waste my time going through it. I put a stop sign, I press F5, so it runs through it one by one. I'm going to go 20, 30, 40, and 50, and I hit Enter. I get four of them, and then I'll come back over here. Obviously, I'm going to print them all in reverse, 50, 40, 30, 20, and I'll go to new line. Then, as you see, num is now pointing to 20. That is the first element in the array, correct? As soon as you do delete, it's not going to point it anymore because now programs are writing on that piece of memory. It's not yours anymore. Same thing over here. CNT is now pointing to the number 4. As soon as you delete the target, it's not your integer anymore. It's garbage and dynamically memory allocate. Dyna dynamic memory allocation is done. Okay, dynamic memory allocation is very simple concept, very simple concept. It becomes so complicated as usually it's students' nightmare because of 
all the things that you do and you forget that single memory to delete or you forget the square bracket, and it's everybody's nightmare. That's why we have languages like Java, because they, they could not manage, and you're gonna come, if we're gonna go to OP345, we're gonna learn new things like smart pointers that they know they are pointing to something dynamic, and they, don't, they delete the, the thing themselves, so you don't have to worry about it. So we have stuff like that in C++ to make it safer. But when it wasn't there, it was very tough to write programs in C. Programs in C, they work extremely fast, but because they are so powerful, with power, as I say, come responsibility, it's the same thing. You have to be extremely careful. You have to make sure any memory you allocate, you always deallocate. It might not be in the same scope. It's possible that you have a function, and that function is allocating memory and just returning you the, the, the address, and some other function is supposed to delete it. We never know. But the whole important thing is to have your mind, you be organized, plan, so you know that you are going to take care of the, 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 the memory you allocated. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is dynamic memory allocation for you. Are we okay? Yes. We let's 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 put let's say it properly. On line twenty-five, I am deleting the memory that is at the address that is in the num. Yes, in the heap. Yes. Your pointer is in your memory. Where it's pointing to is outside of your memory. It's in the heap. It's like you are having an envelope. On the envelope, you have the address China. Envelope is in your hand. Do you have China in your hand? No. The envelope is in your hand. The address points outside of our country. Or, I don't know, Africa somewhere, I don't know. <laughs> Some countries just came to my mind. That's, it's at the exact opposite side of the Earth, so it's the furthest you can go. Yes. Well, what do you mean I deleting the address? I have a question. <clears throat> I have a question. You know what demolition people do, right? Anybody who doesn't understand what demolition is? You know what demolition is? Like, they have buildings that are old, they want to bring it down. Okay? So, you're a demolition person. I'll give you a piece of paper, and I write over there 52-something street, demolish this building. You're going to say, here. Put the paper away? <laughs> no, you go to the address. Who cares about the paper? You follow what I'm saying? That's what it is. Num is pointing to some piece of memory and distance. When you say delete num, you're saying delete the target. Who cares about num? Num is just a piece of address. Are we good? Are we okay? Are we okay with that? Yes. So normally, if we are we are uh, extracting the uh, referencing uh, the uh, value inside, we will like target of it. So why don't we? Because delete. Because delete has target of in its belly. Delete only deletes the target of. Not only that. So delete because delete. Because delete only deals with pointers, because delete only deals with pointers, they said, you don't need to say target of, I'll do the target of for you. So delete has target of in its mechanism. Number one, numero uno, numero dos, second one. Delete does not delete null. So you can safely pass null to it. It will ignore it. So, so you allocate, so, so don't, you don't need to say if num is not equal to null PTR, delete. That's a waste of time. Delete does that. Two things delete has, its in, has in its engine. Number one, it always deletes the target. You don't need to put an asterisk. Amazing question, thank you, okay? Number two, it checks to see if it is actually an address. If it's not, it won't delete it. If you pass it null pointer, it's just dormant. It won't do anything. All right? Are we okay? One, 
Are we okay too? Wow. 315. Okay, I have to, I'm going to go run buy a loader ticket right now. <laughs> Never happened to me before. Yeah, so that's that. And that brings us up to date. That's the thing we were supposed to finish this, this, this week. So please read everything right to the end of dynamic memory allocation. The next day you are coming here, we're going to actually create member variables, mem sorry, member functions, methods, and we're going to dig into real classes, do some real encapsulation, and um, yeah. So be ready for it. Uh, if uh, I'm going to do a posting on how to ask for extensions, OK? You're allowed to ask extensions like twice. I'll put a number for it. After that, you cannot, OK? That means if that's the case, if you are asking extensions five times back to back, it means something's wrong. You have to fix the problem, OK? So you can ask for extensions a couple of times. There is no problem with that. But there is a specific format. And if you don't send that format to me, I will not give you the extension. I'm just going to say you bad format, OK? So I'm going to tell you how it is now, and I'm going to do a posting. I need to know exactly what you want to get extension for, which is the phrase you write in the submitter program. So in submitter program, you submit, you give me a, a name, like 244 slash W1 slash P2 something, that. I need that one. I need to know what is that. Second, you do a dash do, see when is the due date. You calculate exactly what, how many, sorry, you calculate exactly how many days from the due date you need the extension. And you give me the due date for that. So you got to tell me I need five days extension. Not from now, from the due date. Because that's how the submitter works. Submitter gives you extension from the due date. Don't tell me, can I get two days? And it's already five days past due. You should ask for seven days because it was from the due date. Okay? You ask me this information, you get, I'll give you. And you don't need to give me any reason I was sick or was this, that. Okay? Two, three times extension, fine. More than that, you are not getting it. Okay? Remember that. Okay? So a few times extension, fine. And uh, the reason could be I was stuck. The reason could be whatever. You don't need to give me a reason for that, OK? Have a beautiful day.